welcome back to La Pausa. This is episode 10, coming to you from the Pitchside Pub. This is a Pints and Punditry podcast. It's Thursday, February 22nd, and we're coming off a couple days of Champions League action. Except action is not really the word I would use to describe it. Uh, it, it was just sort of there. So we're going to talk about why that is, uh, what can be done about it, should anything be done about it, uh, is this just sort of an anomaly or is this an ongoing thing? I, I'm starting to see some trends here. So I want to talk about the Champions League, some of the changes that are coming for next year. Are they going to solve the problem? And, and what, if anything, should be done about it? So that's, good. that's what we're going to talk about today on the podcast. But before we do, make sure you are following us. If you're listening on Spotify, make sure you follow the podcast so you see when new episodes come out every Monday and Thursday. If you're on YouTube, make sure you follow the channel for this and all the other content that we have. Get down in that comment section. I would love to hear your ideas. I don't know that I have the solution on this one like I usually think I do. Um, In this case, I'm open to a lot of suggestions. I just think something needs to change. So get down in that comment section. I would love to to get your thoughts on this. And of course, if you don't already, follow us on Twitter at PitchSidePub. So we're coming off of of the round of 16. And we had some games last week. We had some games this week. And and the ones yesterday in particular, we had Barcelona-Napoli and we had Arsenal-Porto. And they were just sort of duds. It's not that they were bad games. They were just sort of dull games. And the beauty of the Champions League is you get these midweek night games and... It really doesn't matter who's playing or where they are. The the drama is sort of uh, is just sort of there. It sort of naturally exists, but the teams are sort of sucking the drama out of it. And if it wasn't for the fact that it was the Champions League, and it's at night, and the crowds are typically fired up and or drunk, uh, which tend to go very hand in hand. Uh, but if it wasn't for that and the natural crowd energy, these games would be an absolute snooze fest. And a lot of it has to do with the style of play and the general lack of uh, of enthusiasm. I don't know if enthusiasm is the right word. Urgency is, is definitely uh, an appropriate word here. The lack of urgency uh, on these clubs to, to go ahead and put an opponent away. Um, and I think there's a lot of factors here. Um, you know, you've got the two legs, right? You've got a home and home. So, and these were the first legs of these of these round of sixteen games, or matchups, I should say. So we know that leg two will not have this same problem, right? These teams are going to come out in the second leg, and they're obviously going to play with a lot more urgency. Um, so, so that is a factor, and that you know solves itself in leg two. But we still have to sit through a boring leg one in the process. Um, and, and I'm not suggesting that we go to a, a one leg game, um, a winner-take-all game. I don't think that's the solution because I, I do think one of the great equalizers is that both teams get an opportunity to play on their home pitch. So while that would solve one problem, I think it creates others. And anytime you're talking about uh, adjusting uh, rules and structures of tournaments and setups, you always have to think about the unintended consequences. So there are a lot of ways to to make yesterday's and Tuesday's games more exciting, more out on your front foot, and encourage more offense. There's a, there's a dozen ways to do that, but they all would have additional consequences, not all of which are good. So that's sort of the sticking point here that I that I want to discuss today. So yeah, you could you could eliminate the home and home and just make it one leg, and yeah, you'll see everybody out on the front foot ready to attack, uh, particularly in the second half of those games. But I don't know that's that that's the solution. It, it's it's good that that Arsenal and Porto have to play a game in London and in Portugal. That's a good thing, um, particularly when smaller clubs like a Portuguese club, like Copenhagen, who hosted Manchester City, when they make the round of 16, when they get out of the group stage and they get to host a, a, uh, a big club, one of the world's biggest clubs, they get to host a Champions League game, that's huge. That's huge for the fan base. That's huge for the, the culture. That's huge for the league. That's huge for the country. Um, I mean, last week, Copenhagen turned out turned out to host Manchester City. I mean, they were, that place was amped up. And maybe that's part of why that was the only game that had uh, some scoring in it. It was 3-1. But but even that, Manchester City was not their usual out on the front foot, trying to make it happen kind of you know, aggressive team. Um, even they sort of played like, hey, well, we're going to try not to mess it up. And they did have one counterattack that resulted in a goal. 
But, you know, maybe the crowd there had something to do with it. But I wouldn't want to take that away. I wouldn't want to eliminate the Portos and the Copenhagens uh, from, from the opportunity to host a Champions League game. So, if you were to go to one leg, I would say that it should be at the, uh, the, the lesser team's home, for lack of a better term. I hate saying that, but you know what I mean by that. And I don't know how we would decide that. It would almost require seeding, not drawing, or at least ranking them. Uh, even if you still draw them randomly so that the lower seeded team gets to host, I would prefer it that way uh, if only one gets to do it. But I'll, in general, I'm not in favor of eliminating the home and home. So, so I don't know that that's a good option. The, the other thing that, that used to exist, and, and this used to not be a problem, this, these sort of dull first leg games weren't really a problem because of the away goals rule. So the away team had a sense of urgency to score so that even if they, even if they won 2-2, they now had two goals in their pocket and they could sit back and, and sort of park the bus in leg two. Now that, that made some of the leg two games a little more on the dull side, but you had the other team who had the sense of urgency and, and had to get that goal because let's, let's say it's a 2-2 draw in leg one. Well, whoever was the home team in leg one and is now away, they got to get a goal. They're, they're losing. <laughs> they go into that game, even though they're tied in aggregate, they're losing because of the away goal. So that did create a sense of urgency, but the away goals rule almost felt too powerful. It should, yes, score. The, the idea is to, is to reward teams for scoring on the road, and that is harder to do than scoring at home, but it does feel like it was too much of a reward that, that an away goal shouldn't be worth that much. Um, and, and I don't know that there's really anything in between. So, yes, the away goals rule, if they reinstituted that, it would reinvigorate that sense of urgency in these games, but it almost seems too powerful. Um, that said, it's, it's even. It's evenly powerful, right? So, uh, whichever team is capable of scoring on the road gets a massive boost. And when you, when you talk about rules like this and say, oh, well, that's, that's an awfully powerful rule, as long as it's equitable, that's okay. Um, you may not like what it does to the game, but as long as it's equitable, that's okay. Whereas, whereas eliminating the home and home double leg structure and just having one game at one team's stadium, that is not equitable. That clearly benefits one side or the other. So unless you went to a neutral location, uh, there's no way to do that without benefiting one club. And you don't want to go to a neutral location until the finals because the atmospheres are are part of the 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 DNA of the Champions League. So you wouldn't want to eliminate that. So. If it sounds like I'm thinking out loud here, I kind of am. I, like I said, I don't have the solutions. And again, get in the comments section and let me know what you think is the right solution. Are these the right solutions or not? The away goals I'd be okay with if they brought it back, but I get why they got rid of it. I'm not against the fact that they got rid of that. Um, it was too powerful. You could do some wacky things. You could do things like, rather than draw randomly for the round of 16, the round of 8, and the semis to see who you're going to play, uh, you could reseed based on number of goals scored in the previous round, right? So you take the group stages and you take the the 16 teams in advance and you and you rank them by goals scored in that group stage, not differential, scored, right? To promote offense, and that's whoever scored the most is the top seed, and whoever scored in second, third, fourth, down to the last, and and those are your matchups, and that would theoretically promote offense, right? If you are in this round of 16 and you want an easier draw in the round of eight and you don't want to be the the team that gets the short straw and draws Manchester City or draws Real Madrid, um, you better go score some damn goals. <laughs> that's, that's your solution. And so that is enough to get you out on the front foot. That's wacky. I don't know. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just thinking outside the box here. That would... That would alter the way these teams play. Um, everybody always gets real bad out of shape when I say eliminate the draws. I, I said that in the FA Cup uh, episode I did a little while ago about ways you can fix the FA Cup. FA Cup. I hate the random draw. There's so much randomness to it. it. It really, really takes away from the mission of any competition, which is to determine which team played the best. Um, a uh, great example, Copenhagen's playing really well. They probably won't advance because they got Manchester City. But if they had drawn Porto, they'd have had a real good shot. Um, you know, and, and so it's it's just not fair, and I hate the randomness to it. So I'd be fine with reseeding 
in a number of different ways. I don't know that doing it on goals scored is the way to go, but hey, if we're looking to get teams out on the front foot and get them trying to score, that would certainly do it. So it's not it's not too, too crazy. But that's the issue is you've got these first legs and these teams just sit back and, and they're playing not to lose. They're playing these games not to lose. It's like the goal is to just hang around so that when you get to leg two, you still got a ball game, right? And, and look at Arsenal. They didn't get a shot on goal the entire game. How is that possible? Well, they didn't play particularly well, and Porto did play very well, but there also just wasn't much urgency. And, it, and, it's, and you know, it's, it's like, and it very well may have been the case, that they know they've got another game in their back pocket, and so all they need to do is just not get blown out. And, and I'm sure they would have rather it been 0-0 or 1-1 than be down one nothing. But nevertheless, they're still in good shape um, to, to go ahead and beat Porto in the second leg. And so that just does not, it does not uh, encourage watchable, exciting football. Now, you can argue that it doesn't matter if it's exciting football. The, the tournament itself is exciting. And there is something to that. Like I said, if this was a midweek game in, in league, It'd be a snooze fest, but because it's the Champions League, everybody's amped up, the crowd's hammered, and, and they're all fired up and yelling, and so there's a certain amount of urgency to that, but, but that doesn't mean we can't do better. Um, and there are changes coming. Next year's Champions League has, has some significant changes, but they're all group stage changes. Um, for those that aren't familiar, the Champions League is going from 32 teams to 36 teams next year, uh, and there's a whole bunch of back and forth about how they're going to determine those last four teams. That's a different topic. But all of those teams are going to go into one pot, and they're going to be seeded by different categories, and they're going to play eight different teams in different categories, and it's really complicated. But basically, everybody's in one big pot. They're going to take the top 24. Is that right, 24? Uh, eight are going to advance. Nine through 24 play each other, <laughs> and then the winners of those advance to play the first eight. So it's complicated. Um, but... But none of those changes, and the, the point of those changes is so we don't get these um, these games at the end of the group where a team's already clinched. That's happened to some of the bigger clubs over the past few years. They get to the last game of the group stage, and it doesn't matter because they've already clinched, and so they play a lot of backups. And, and the Champions League, the UEFA, does not want that. They want the Stars out on their Tuesday and Wednesday nights. They want the, the uh, Kylian Mbappes and the Jude Bellinghams and the... Uh, Kevin De Bruyne's and Erling Hollands, they want those guys playing. And they're not when, when a team has already clinched a group stage. So uh, they're, they're changing it so that these games continue to matter. And that's fine. I have no problem with that other than the fact that it's, it's uh, needlessly complicated. But that's not going to fix the round of 16s. The round of 16 is staying exactly the same. Once we get to these 16 teams, nothing changes. So all the changes that are in effect don't solve the problem that I'm discussing, which is the the dud of, of games that are happening right now. And, and this, will, this will eventually work itself out as we get to the round of eight and, 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 and the semis. And it didn't happen in the finals because it's one game and you're done. But when you've got these two-legged games, it, it really does encourage this sort of behavior, this sort of play, which is, all right, we've got 180 plus of stoppage time. We've got almost 200 minutes of football against these guys. Let's just not screw it up early. Right? Why would we? Why would we go hard? Why would we attack, 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 and risk any sort of counterattack, any sort of defensive liability, uh, and and give up a goal and put ourselves in a hole? Why would we do that? Let's just pass it around and sit back and maintain possession. Particularly when you're the better club and you can do that and you can just bully them and, and maintain possession for half the game and nothing happens and and so it just really wasn't exciting, which is a shame because I love I love the Champions League. I love these midweek games and I love. Uh, I love the, the when you get to the knockout round and teams, you know, glories on the line. I did listen. I buy into it. I drink the Kool Aid. Uh, I love the campaign here in the states about uh, nobody watches it the way we do because they're showing guys watching it at work and watching it, you know, in, in, in out and about on their phones and and you know all this stuff. That's exactly what it is. I'm sitting here in in my office watching it, and it's great. Um, but then you put it on and it's just sort of like, eh, that was a game. Okay, uh, so I, I'd love to see some improvements. Like I said, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I threw my suggestion out there, but I don't know that it would be great. I would love to hear your suggestions. How do we fix this? How do we, how do we make it more exciting? How do we encourage the front foot kind of play once we get to this round? It's not a problem in the group stage. It's not a problem at the end. 
But these rounds, these two-legged rounds of, of 16, 8, and, and the semis, I believe, is, is also two legs, um, it does encourage this sort of behavior. So how do we solve this? How do we solve this? I'd love to hear your comments. Uh, get down in the comments section. would love to hear your thoughts on this, on how we solve this problem. Really, no idea is stupid. Uh, I may tell you why it doesn't work. I'm always thinking about the unintended consequences, but... You know, I'd really like to see some sort of change to this because we got to get some excitement. Get all the best players in the world. None of them are trying to score. That's not a good. That's not a good setup. So, um, you know, get your thoughts in the comments section. I'd love to hear it. Uh, while you're down there, make sure you subscribe to the channel here on YouTube. Make sure you follow us on Spotify, and of course, hit us up on Twitter at Pitchside Pub. You can throw some ideas out there. This is going to be an ongoing topic because it's not going away. The the Champions League is we're we're, we're smack in the middle of things. Um, the last part of this is, is it because it's drawn out so much? Is that part of it too? Um, is, is there a lack of excitement because we haven't had Champions League games in a month? Um, we haven't had, you know, the, the, the group stage ended before the new year. And now it's February. So we go like six weeks without these games. And then you have, you have the, the leg one and then you have like two weeks off before leg two. Would it be would it be more exciting? Would it create some additional pressure if you played these games in the same week? Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Sunday. Um, they're not going to change that. Champions League loves their midweek uh, setup, but then then make it week after week. Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Um, you know, there's there's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. But I do think the fact that there's two weeks between legs does sort of make you almost forget that the competition exists. It's a little dramatic, but. It does make you sort of forget that the competition is there. And it's like, oh yeah, Manchester City's going to host Copenhagen again. I forgot. What did they do last game? Oh yeah, 3-1. to one. I remember that game. Okay. It's, you've sort of forgotten about it and moved on because they're in other competitions. And particularly the English teams. You know, you got a you got a Carabao Cup final coming up. And of course those teams aren't still in the Champions League. But nevertheless, um, you know, there's so much else going on. There's so much football going on that, that having this gap between the legs... Does sort of <laughs> get between the legs. Uh, does sort of encourage uh, you to forget that it's even happening. So um, I don't know if that's a problem or if that needs to be solved or not. But it's something that that I've seen people mention, and I definitely have thought about. And it it doesn't really encourage the all in nature, right? We love when something's all consuming. Again, here in the states, we have March Madness, right? And for a couple weeks, it consumes us. And one weekend a year, St. Patrick's Day weekend every year. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the sports world revolves around college basketball. I don't even like college basketball when I watch it because it is it is everything at once. It's like the the last day of the Premier League when all the teams play at the same time. And you got a game here and you got a game over there and we need to know the results of that. And it's, oh my God, that creates such drama when you've got these other things happening at once. And I understand the Champions League wants every one of their games to get a focus. So they spread it out two games a night. And, and that way you can watch as much of the product as possible. But <clears throat> I'm not sure that's really a, the solution. It's, it's more of a short-term solution to generate TV revenue and not thinking long-term enough in terms of generating the excitement. The excitement. I do think UEFA does take for granted that there will just inherently be excitement about the Champions League simply because it's the Champions League. And, and I do wonder if they're exploiting that a little bit and, and taking advantage of it and taking it for granted and not doing enough to help continually generate that excitement. Because um, no matter what it is, it'll get stale. It'll get stale. So I do wonder if putting you know, the first and second leg of these, of these ties together, closer together, or, or playing all these games at the same time, uh, wouldn't create more excitement, similar to what happens in the group stage when you've got all these games going on at once. So, um, you know, and there's ways to arrange that in the schedule, and, and maybe it's not spread out as much or what have you, but I'm sure I'm sure that could be worked out logistically. So I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that as well. Uh, how do you feel about the games being spread out? Do you kind of forget that your team is even in the Champions League? Um, you know, how do you feel about the Champions League if your team's not in it? Do you even watch? Do you care? Is it fun to watch the stars go out there? Not when they're not trying to score. <laughs> not when not when Jude Bellingham's sitting deep, right? That's not fun. So I'd love to get your thoughts. Get your comments down below. Uh, you can leave your comments on Spotify as well. Uh, like I said, follow the channel, follow the podcast, and of course, follow us on Twitter at PitchSidePub. That's going to be it for today on La Pausa, a Pints and Punditry podcast. Thanks for joining us here 
at the Pitchside Pub. <laughs>